I'm very excited to be um, the moderator for this evening's panel. I am Ellie Hayworth, and I am the kind of co-host, if you will, with Code Art for the Art Talk series. So we participate in um, a quarterly talk series where we are, you know, really kind of exploring the art market, but the digital art market as a way to show, you know, all of the Code Art community, whether it's, you know, the students and the young ladies or the educators and their parents, just, a, you know, our tech enthusiasts that there is both a professional as well as a creative application to all things code. So we're really excited. This is the second iteration in our, you know, our, our talk panel series. I'm gonna go ahead and start um, sharing my screen and I can give you guys just a little bit more of the lowdown on all things code art. So, as I mentioned, the Art Talk series is a quarterly series, and we either speak with artists who inspire us, or we speak with a series of professionals who also inspire us in terms of, you know, all things art and tech. So today we have an amazing panel. It is the future female ladies in, or I'm sorry, future female leaders, also ladies, <laughs> in code art. And we have an amazing group of young ladies that are really pioneering kind of the next generation. So we have um, Sofia Garcia, who is the co-founder of Artex Code. We have um, Zoe Bachman, the Senior Curriculum Manager at Code Academy, And we also have Andrea Stoyer, who is the Director of CADAF, which is the Contemporary and Digital Art Fair, as well as Digital Art Month. So we really have kind of a great roster of um, you know, thought leaders, if you will, in the space joining us today. And I think you know, we're just kind of excited to kick this off. So first and foremost, I think for everybody who's joining us today, you should have some familiarity with Code Art. But Code Art is a Miami nonprofit that is really um, committed to bridging the gender gap in art and I'm sorry, in tech. And we're doing so by inspiring, you know, a cohort of the next generation of young ladies to see all of the different applications of code and computer science in the real world, whether that's creative outlets, professional outlets. Um, or simply, you know, education, different education opportunities. So we are hoping to inspire um, the next generation, really, with some of these different conversations about what code can do for you. Um, code Art does a number of different programs. The Code Art Fest is always a fantastic digital forum. Um, every year that happened earlier this spring, we do professional development. We have workshops and different events. So just, you know, Please, if you guys want to learn more about Code Art, don't hesitate to, to reach out to any of us. Um, we'll send a follow up after this, but we're really excited to be kind of hosting this series, if you will, on behalf of the Code Art community. We also have an amazing group of sponsors, and we truly couldn't be doing this art talk without our sponsors. Oliver Gal is a marketplace for the art world. They are really kind of democratizing art and they do so by, um, you know, licensing different artists work at places like Kohl's and Target and making it something that is approachable and accessible to a wide audience. And of course, Code Academy today is one of, um, you know, our supporting sponsors. And also we have Zoe Bachman on the panel to speak a bit more. But Code Academy is really this leading online platform for individuals to learn to code. And they are doing so at scale. And it's really kind of democratizing the market as well in the sense that you can learn to code at home. And they also partner with several different kind of corporations and institutions to um, facilitate coding as part of the kind of continued education at different companies. So they're really bridging a lot of the gaps in the market. And I think, you know, as we talk about gender equity and, you know, being a female leader in both code and art, this is definitely a great place for us to, to have Code Academy on, on board. So thank you guys. So I think first and foremost, um, we have a beautiful photo, or actually these rather um, moving iterative, they're algorithmically based artworks um, from the Digital Art Month, as well as the CADAF, um, which as I mentioned is the Contemporary and Digital Art Fair that Andrea is gonna be speaking on behalf of. I think you know it would be really great for us to start by just asking our panelists about their journey to art. 
So Andrea, maybe you can kick us off. You had a very kind of traditional career trajectory. Um, you worked at traditional auction houses and then you found your way to digital art. Can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to the art world in the first place and what is super exciting for you about digital art? Of course, thank you, Ali. Thank you for having me today. It's very exciting to be here. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, I started, I graduated from art direction with a minor in art history, and I actually ended up in the advertising industry for a while. And then after being there for a couple of years, I did a master's at Christie's auction house. And I loved it so much and my minor was always in uh, art history and I would always volunteer for museums, intern for museums, but then I decided to completely switch to the art world. So I was at Christie's for a while and then after some time I met uh, Elena Savilev and she was doing these conferences on art and blockchain and we were meeting so many interesting artists and with so many interesting people doing new things in the, in the like in the industry that we thought, well, there's not one place that can show all this artworks, like this digital artwork. So that's how Kadaf was born, that we decided to create an art fair that showcases digital art in the best way possible and kind of design an art fair around the art, more than just place art in an art fair. So that's how I found my way into Kadaf, and we've been active since 2019 now. So it's been two physical editions and two editions online. And then this uh, past October during the lockdown was where Digital Art Month was born that I can tell you a bit more later. But that's in summary how I got introduced to the digital art world. I love it. And I think, you know, that is kind of a perfect segue to our next panelist, which is um, Sofia Garcia. And I think, you know, to segue on what you mentioned, Andrea, we, you know, we're looking at the digital art market. It is a burgeoning industry in a lot of ways. And a lot of these artists have been creating art either algorithmically, they're using code, they've been doing so on their computers for years, and there wasn't really a marketplace for them. And I think, Sofia, this you know, obviously the digital art fair is a really amazing new opportunity. Sophia comes at this perspective from a bit of a different aspect of the market, which is you represent algorithmically based artists. Um, and you do so in a way that both lends itself to kind of physical art, as well as the digital iteration of those works. So you are a gallerist and you also are a design strategist for Onyx with JP Morgan. Can you tell us a little bit about both kind of the creative aspect of your, of your professional coding life and your professional aspect with JP Morgan? I mean, yeah, definitely. I think uh, Artix Code has really been a creative outlet for my, like for myself in general. I think I, I love uh, the technical side and the creative side of my job, which is both, um, you know, very design strategy heavy, but I'm also, I've been a developer for professionally for the past, you know, uh, five, six years. Um, so when I first started to get into to coding and uh, you know, the like. I, I had actually been studying art history and I was working at a gallery and, and that's what really um, fascinated me once I started to learn how to code. I really saw it like, you know, highlighting the, the human aspect behind technology. So when I started just, I honestly started Artix Code as an Instagram account to really just share the work that was out there that I was really into that I was like, oh my God, someone made this with code, how cool. And it wasn't until I went to one of the blockchain art talks in New York that uh, uh, Elena, how we had mentioned previously, had, had you know started doing that. I heard about Kadaf and I figured, well, I have a collection of generative artwork, algorithmic artwork, so to speak. and. I should just show it. I should show people what's up. I should show people, you know, what what these artists are doing. And and it was amazing. And that first year, you know, we that first iteration of it, which, which was in New York, was amazing. We sold out the show. The one that you're looking at here on the slide is uh, the was in Miami in December of 2019. And and it was amazing. It was it was so fun to kind of like be able to have a show that looks like this, but it's actually all created with code and you know because of my 
uh, you know, technical background, I, I can, you know, digest a beat, at least explain to the everyday person why it is so interesting and, and the, what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and, and they, the two sides of my, I guess, career really play, play extremely well with each other. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm happy that I have both. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, this is also kind of a great segue. Zoe, I'd love to kind of kick it over to you. Zoe, you know, as the senior curriculum manager at Code Academy, you know, we've been speaking a lot about these artists that have already been, you know, in the market creating work, they've been playing with different code technology, but we also have a whole new generation of individuals who see the value um, and are also willing to self-teach all of these you know, all of these different skills. So, you know, on one hand, you're helping to build curriculum that is lending itself to the next generation. On the other hand, you have a very interesting kind of community collaborative driven art practice. And it lives very much in the analog, but it utilizes several tools that you have, you know, adapted from code. So maybe you can give us a little bit of a synopsis of your journey to art and tech. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so art and tech have always been a part of my life. I've always been super interested in studio art. I was, you know, making art from a very young age. And meanwhile, my dad was actually in like security and IT practices. So I got some exposure. I even got to take an HTML class when I was in middle school, which was quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, art was, you know, initially kind of like my first love. Um, I went to school and studied art history. It's really cool to hear about a lot of other people here who studied art history. Um, I also studied art via anthropology and uh, anthropology was actually what brought me back into technology. I had the opportunity to study abroad in West Africa, became really interested in how technology adoption was happening there. And honestly saw a lot of similarities between how art and technology are forms of expression and uh, are also tools that we can use to build our communities with. So um, I went back into the art world. I was a community artist and art teacher for many years. And that's what ended up bringing me also back into tech was that I was doing a lot around media literacy. I was really interested in you know, teaching my students not just what it was like to sort of you know, express what was within them, but to think critically about what they saw in the rest of the world. So you know, something they would always engage with, of course, would be, you know, mobile games, being on websites and thought, you know, if we're teaching students how to, you know, make their own PSAs or their own videos, wouldn't it be really cool to like also show them how to build their own websites. Um, and, you know, I think one of the main things that bridged my direction, you know, further into becoming a coding teacher was really this idea of accessibility. You know, I got into the arts because art was super important to me, but I also recognized that art wasn't always something that could be part of everybody's lives. And so, you know, that's why I decided to like join nonprofits, be a community artist, really make art something that everyone could be a part of. And I saw a lot of similarities in tech as I started teaching myself actually on Codecademy, how to, you know, how to program back in 2013. Uh, tech felt like, you know, this kind of very closed door, only a couple people could be coders and Code Academy really opened up this opportunity by presenting this, um, you know, this curriculum online for free for folks to say like, hey, I could be a programmer too. Um, so I think there's, you know, a lot of work that can be done in both areas to continue to make these experiences more accessible for individuals. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think, you know, what you guys are seeing on the screen right now that I'm sharing is one of your more recent courses that you guys have launched, um, which is P5JS. And you guys are essentially empowering individuals to create, um, I think kind of to the point of what you just said, Zoe, you know, it's this idea of building a world and build, you know, creative expression and using code as kind of a language to do so. And so I'm just showing you guys, there's like a live stream that we can circulate after, um, after this panel that, is on YouTube that you can see different kind of coding courses. Um, and we can also, you know, certainly provide information about P5JS if anybody is interested. But I think this is something that is really near and dear to code art as well, because, you know, for the Code Fest, we had Danielle Feinstein speak, who is the lighting director at Pixar. And she was speaking so kind of purportedly about how code has facilitated, you know, she speaks about light as kind of bringing, truly bringing life into what otherwise feels like a very kind of like digitized analog feeling kind of 
pixelated world. But when you add light, you really bring things to life. And I think, you know, something like learning JavaScript and learning how to actually create these worlds is the way that this all comes to fruition. So I just, you know, that's my, my little code art plug here. I think oh. all, we're all very much in the same family of this. Yeah, I, I also just wanted to, to highlight just P5 and processing in general, like that foundation is the best. I think the reason I am still coding to this day is because of P5 and Dan Schiffman and everyone who who is who's part of it, like Laura McCarthy. I know for the first um, uh, uh, code art, uh, like fast code art Miami, we had her sign a, a, a book of like intro to P5 for the girls. We got a lot of processing gear. Um, you know, it, it's I can't speak highly, like highly enough about it. So um, I just had to say that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Plus one, like they were, they were actually, I was super fortunate. They were my teachers in grad school. So that's how we got this course made was because like, I know Schiffman, I know Lauren, and they were super wonderful about, you know, reviewing the course, circulating it to their communities. They're incredible people. Yeah. That's amazing. Zoe, I feel like, you know, the the last question that we just kind of posed is a perfect kind of um transition point because we're kind of moving into speaking about an exciting future for for code and art um and my question to you is as you guys are envisioning curricula and different courses what is kind of the most energizing aspect of building and teaching code in the way that you guys do with code Cat? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to focus on just one, but, um, you know, I think, you know, if I had to think what about two, one, questions, can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think a, a huge focus for us is around um, teaching people the skills that they need to get jobs, right? Like we know that we're getting into a more technical workforce and that can look a lot like a lot of different things. It could be someone just gaining a certain amount of tech literacy, understanding even just the basics of how websites work and how that can be part of their jobs, all the way to the person who's, you know, the professional software engineer or the security specialist. So what I really love about our platform is that we have curriculum for anyone within that spectrum, you know, so we're really excited about how someone finds out what coding is and how they can integrate it into their lives. You know, the smallest being let me take a course on HTML so I can make some cool marketing templates all the way to let me do this full stack, you know, career path. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that there's just like a lot of really incredible opportunities for individuals, um, you know, and, and I will also say like our content isn't just purely obviously jobs focused, you know, P5. Yeah, maybe you have the opportunity to become a generative artist and are coding really cool projects and selling them as NFTs. Um, but what I love about this course in particular is that, again, it's that idea of accessibility and like how to engage beginners who are just starting to explore the world of code. Like, yeah, processing in P5 were my kind of entrance point, you know, beyond my like little experience with HTML in middle school, but like the first time I was actually like coding for real and seeing an output, you know, I remember it was like some assignment where I had to like, you know, it was just like a static image. And I was just like, this is amazing, you know, like translating my experience as like a studio artist and being like, oh, and I can use loops and just like, you know, to like create all of these different shapes at once across the page. And, um, and so, you know, to bring it back to kind of like how that complements the professional side, I think, you know, people aren't one dimensional, even though they might be learning code for their job they still want opportunities to express themselves and get really creative and so something like p5 someone could be learning javascript have familiarity with web development and this just shows them how they can spin their skills in a totally new and really fun way i love that um i think from an experiential standpoint i'd love to kick it over to andrea because you know we can take it back to the digital art month i think on a very different side of things and a very kind of you know creative side of things especially during a time where we were all in quarantine and quite siloed this is digital art month and these are um augmented reality artificial reality artworks that live by way of Instagram in the real world. Um, you can kind of see them out in the world. Tell us a little bit about Digital Art Month and for you, what is the most exciting thing about kind of the future of art and tech? 
Sure. So, yeah, so Digital Art Month uh, came about uh, last October. We had the first edition in New York and it was a beautiful and very exciting product for us because we really love hosting events on, uh, in person. And with the pandemic, we had to cancel our Paris edition of Kadaf that we were going to take the whole fair to Paris. And then we had to end up doing it online. That ended up being a great experience as well. Now it led us to now develop our own platform to host art fairs. So uh, Digital Art Month, it was us brainstorming what can we do that is in person, that is a hybrid event between digital and physical and like to bridge the two together and to help people get outside and experience art in a safe way. So we started thinking and definitely augmented reality was one of the best ways to do so. Mm -hmm. And we found so many artists working in augmented reality through Instagram and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And we focused on the social media platforms mostly because we didn't want to put a barrier between the viewer like the general visitor that can maybe just bought an iPhone for the first time or like just it's not good with technology or anything we didn't want to put a barrier that they had to download anything and Instagram or Snapchat people usually already have it on their phones so what we did is we partnered with the New York City Business Improvement Districts and we had artworks placed on Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, Meatpacking, Flatiron, all throughout the city. And not only was it great for the artists because we connect them directly to the public. When a person, a person goes on the street and finds one of these labels that you can also find through an interactive map that we create on our site, you can plan your own art walk. But when you scan one of the QR codes, it takes you directly into the artist profile. So you can look at his all his other artwork and then you can experience the filter. And it's kind of like merging both realities. And one thing that was very special was that the project also helped the city in a time where the commerce was kind of down. It gets people to go outdoors and in a very safe way because all the artworks are placed outside. But then they go, um, I don't know, they go to Flatiron and they end up going to the ice cream shop or to the coffee shop or they might have lunch or they might go into the store where the label is placed. So not only does it help artists, but it also helped reactivate the cities that were a little bit asleep. So right now we're taking Digital Art Month to Paris and it's going to happen the 1st of June. So we're getting everything ready and it's gonna run for the whole month of June and we're gonna be hosting then Kadaf in the middle of the month. So right now I think we have 55 artists and over a hundred works placed around all Paris. And so I think stay tuned here, like some um, maybe previews of what you will see on the streets of Paris. I love it. I love it. Um, Sophia, we're going to transition. I, so just for context for everybody who is, you know, watching today, this is Artex Code. So Sophia's gallery that was physically at Kadath um, in Miami several years. Is this Miami or New York, Sophia? This one was, this one was Miami. Okay. Good one, yeah. Um, but I want to segue us just in the interest of time and Sophia, we're going to use you as our kind of professional, um, we're going to pick your professional brain on this, <laughs> okay. but when everybody signed up for today's, um, for today's talk, we spoke a bit about, you know, kind of unpacking the NFT market. And so many of your artists do work in, you know, digital is their medium. They do have analog work. So you can buy a print by them. You can buy, you know, artworks that can physically live on the walls. But I am sure everybody has heard about this phenomenon of the non-fungible token or the NFT. Um, this is just one platform. We're not affiliated in any way, but this is called Foundation, just to give everybody who's watching today an idea of what these like auction drops kind of look like on the platform. Um, but Sophia, tell us maybe in layman's terms or as sophisticatedly as you like, like let's unpack the NFT idea. Talk to us a little bit about NFTs. I mean, this could be an entire discussion all on its own, but I will keep it simple. Um, it's 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 kind of this idea of um, to put it simply, the digital original. And you know, growing up in our digital age, we see images all the time, and you know, we share them, and you know, we can we can copy them, we can post them on our Instagram, all these things, um, and it's really hard to figure out 
like, where did this even come from? And so now we have, uh, you know, the advent of blockchain technology, you know, again, all of this crypto and all these things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, blockchain is just this idea of a very public, decentralized, um, you know, I use the word ledger, but I, it, it, that doesn't really say much for the everyday person, but kind of like a database, so to speak. Like I can, so this idea now is that everyone in the world can basically see an artist, see an artwork um, out there and be able to trace it back to an artist. And let me take it back a, like another step. Sorry, I kind of got excited there. But when, <laughs> when you have an NFT, what's happening is on, on this blockchain that everyone can access, it's not owned by anyone, it's owned by everyone, you have this block of information. Inside this information, you have your artwork, you have the person who created it, you have um, you know, any metadata they want associated with that, which is amazing. But what's really, really cool about NFTs and what's the really important part about this is that we can track them as they move around the ecosystem. So if I made this artwork, cool, but if someone bought it, I can see who bought it and for how much. And every time it switches hands, you have this lit, you basically can track it all the way back to the artist. So in the sense of the art, the traditional art world, we have this whole idea of provenance of knowing who owned the artwork before you. You also have, you know, the prevalence of fraud and, you know, seeing who like is this a legitimate art piece. And because of the way uh, this decentralized, you know, just ecosystem works, um, you know, we have these uh, websites like OpenSea that are kind of like the Google of, uh, of, of NFTs. You can look at an artist's profile, verify that the artwork that you're interested in actually came from the artist that you want, you wanted. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's really, really cool. And it's not just, um, you know, when people think about NFTs, they think about it as just an image, but there's so much more behind it uh, that 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 makes it really, really fascinating and, and really strengthen, strengthens the, the digital art market because we finally have a way to have that digital original. And that to me is like the most exciting thing ever. Um, and it's just like couldn't be here. At, and specific just because we are talking about code art and this idea of generative art, we it's even better for that because you can actually store your code on chain and be able to actually own like the guts of the artwork, which is the coolest thing ever. So, you know, typically when I did a show and, you know, this is a generative piece here, um, you know, I could have a print, but it's really hard to talk to someone, tell someone that. So I would usually have like a, a, a printout of the the SVG or, you know, the, whatever the code was that, that was outputted. But now you actually like, you can actually just buy buy the piece as it like renders right then and there. Um, hopefully, I didn't lose all of you guys by all. But this is this is you know there, there's a lot there's a lot to unpack here, um, and and it's a really exciting thing. So if I confuse you, just keep just keep looking into it because it's awesome. Um, <laughs> hopefully, it helped though. No, and I think you know from my perspective, um, you know I didn't I didn't kind of introduce myself as the moderator, but I you know I'm an art consultant, I'm an art advisor, and I actually represent two artists, one of which is a digital artist, and there you know for a number of years there was a kind of quiet market for this. There were a lot of there was an interesting kind of marketplace, and there was an audience and a community that was starting to build, but it wasn't very public facing. And in the past six months or so, we all are starting to kind of gain um, some familiarity with this market. And we're obviously seeing some of these artworks transact at really crazy values. And, you know, it's very kind of refreshing in a lot of ways because something that was seen as kind of a fringe market or something that was not necessarily mainstream is now, you know, all these blue chip artists are getting in the game, but they're just at a pretty similar level playing field as some of yeah. the other, you know, other newbies. So it's kind of a democratic market and it's it's in the making. So that's that's fun in a lot of ways. Um, and I think Andrea, we wanted to ask you just, you know, who are you seeing? Because you do sell NFTs, the new, the Kadaf art fair that will take place in June. Um, you can sell physical artwork, you can sell an NFT. Talk to us a little bit about kind of the growing audience. Like 
you know, how, how are you guys helping to educate? With, just talk to us a little bit about that experience. Of course. So it definitely has been such a, like a great experience this last few months because we've been around for a while. Um, there was always a lot of interest and a lot of supporters, but now more than ever, with Kadaf, even though we do show NFTs and we love NFTs, we focus on showing like the wide range of mediums under digital art. So we show a lot of video art, a lot of generative art, uh, NFTs, uh, augmented reality. We really want to show like the diverse mediums that exist in this category. Um, I think over the last couple of months, it's been very interesting to see more like the traditional art market becoming interested in this kind of art. And I think more than ever, it's very important to educate the artist and to curate the art very well, because what we're seeing is also an overflow of content that yeah. you sometimes go to look for something and you want to, okay, I'm a new collector. I want to buy an NFT. I go and sometimes I see all these things and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. So I think that we reached a moment that is very exciting. The prices, of course, we love the headlines, uh, but I think the market needs to, it's still very immature and it's going to stabilize itself and it needs to like correct itself for it to become like stable. But I think that right now curation and galleries and really education around that is so important because we cannot just have this overflow of content. We need to take a look. And the most important thing is focusing back on the art because even though NFTs are awesome and I think it's amazing that artists can have so much control over their work and have received like royalties and everything is amazing but we need to focus back on the art and just remember that the NFTs are a vehicle that allow for this to happen but anything can be an NFT so I think focusing back on the artists the, the creators and really people that are kind of artists and then create an NFT um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but we will be showing a lot of them actually for our June edition, this coming June edition of Kadaf Online, we will have our focus section will be NFTs where all the marketplaces, OpenSea, Super Rare, and many more will curate a selection of only 12 artworks that they will show at Kadaf. So it should be a lot of fun to see. I love that. I love that. I, w I also wanted to just like note that it's, it's something that, uh, is just like that curation side of it. it. It it really is so so important. I know we kind of investigated like doing something like you know just curating a selection of artwork and putting it on our profile. And the collect collectors were so happy. They were just like, oh my god, finally! Like just like tell me what's like like show me show me the artwork. Like tell me tell me what's good. And you know it within like twenty almost not even 48 hours, you know, everything's gone because everyone's just like, look, they want to know where the good artwork is. And right now there's just so much. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to see how the space develops and kind of trying to see how these marketplaces also start innovating and making sure that it's a, it's easy to, to digest and actually look for what you want. Yeah, it's definitely right now, but it's really interesting to see so many coming up and so many traditional artists like trying these new mediums. Yeah. I think just keeping the conversation going and talk. we do a lot of talks, artist talks, panel discussions to also educate the collector market because we have a collector, like a collectors, but there's also new collectors that are coming into the field from a more traditional or from a tech background or anything that really need a little bit of more guidance yeah. or want more guidance. <laughs> Um, Zoe, I am going to kick it over to you. Um, some of these projects are a bit more analog in terms of um, their output, and yet many of them have a huge tech component. And you, just to kind of preface, and I know you'll dive into this, but you know, you're very interested in kind of community driven art projects and the collaborative projects. So I think this idea for me, the kind of next theme I'd like to unpack is the idea of community. And so I'd love to just have you, um, I know these are three distinct projects. Maybe we, you know, you can touch on all three of them, but if we, maybe we choose one to just talk about in the interest of time. Um, but yeah, I want to kick it over to you to hear a little bit more about your art. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned in my intro, I've been um, previously a community artist and art teacher. I've also been part of art collaboratives for the past 10 years or so, um, primarily doing um, projection art, as you can see in that bottom left corner, that was with my group, The Illuminator. I was also part of a group, um, this is in New York, I was part of a group in Baltimore previous to that as well. Um, I'm also part of another collective called Tendernet. Uh, this is one of the zines there. I'll think I'll, I'll talk about that one a little bit more because I think it works well for this audience. Um, and then the piece in the upper right corner was a piece I did in grad school at ITP at NYU that was called Dream Date. It was a VR piece. It was really fun. Um, Given my background in anthropology, research, critiquing technology, this was sort of a look at, a uh, tongue in cheek look at what would happen if um, we all were just like in VR headsets all the time, basically, and how we'd have to relearn how to flirt with people. So it was like using that like classic VR as tutorial medium, but like getting into flirting. So that's why there's a mannequin there. You actually like had sensors on it that you had to touch and would uh, react to that. But um, Tendernet. Tendernet um, is a collective that uh, two of my friends and I started a couple of years ago. We're a group of researchers, artists, educators, and activists, and we're all also interested in thinking critically about new forms of technology. We're specifically doing that through the um, lens of an intersectional feminist framework. Yeah. So this was the first zine we had put out. Becca, uh, Ricks, and I have been collaborators since we went to grad school together at ITP and previously done like AR workshops that we taught things like that. Um, but we were interested in putting um, something together for the scene fest that happened at the School for Poetic Computation, which is this super cool, yeah, <laughs> Sophia knows, <laughs> super I cool so we can geek out about the theater, it's so fun. <laughs> yeah, um, it's uh, based, in, uh, based in New York, in Manhattan, um, and they had this really awesome um, tech zine fest that happened a couple of years ago. So um, at the time, I was living alone and was thinking a lot about this like bizarre relationship I had to my Alexa device that sometimes I would like not talk to people in, except for talking to my Alexa. Um, so we started thinking again pretty critically about like, what does it mean to own an Alexa? Like, why are we gendering, you know, these devices? What is this history of women in technology, particularly women as assistants, right? Like women as phone operators, women who are the original computers. Um, I'm sure folks here have seen um, the Hidden Figures movie, most likely. Um, so really kind of unpacking that within this context of, um, again, this one was a, a little bit tongue in cheek, um, kind of had a personal essay in there about this like weird intimacy and relationship with my Alexa and then, you know, getting into this research side of it as well. So we've been uh, doing workshops, exploring, you know, uh, we've put together our own feminist framework for thinking about voice-based technologies. We do uh, workshops around designing voice-based interactions. We've done that at a couple of museums, a couple of festivals, and uh, have output a couple of other zines with that. Yeah. I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> I think there is something so, um, eerie and yet um exciting about the fact that we're kind of we have newfound relationships with our technology and they're they're kind of learning along with us and i think you know we're seeing so many different markets open up so i i appreciate that there's a bit of a um you know both a critical eye as well as a bit of a com comical lens that you're looking at some of these different you know these topics that we're all grappling with as we continue to kind of navigate the new digital interface it's really amazing. Um, I'd love to kick it over to, um, actually, I'm gonna, Andrea, we'll end with your slide um, as we start concluding. But I wanted to kick it over to Sophia because speaking of interpersonal relations and community, um, you know, during the pandemic, you had this really interesting project that I think you actually spoke to Kodar last week about or included it in one of your your presentations so talk to us a little bit about this avatar that you put in times square <laughs> oh you're on mute sophia classic um okay so i have to give a huge shout out to jess Kanatzer, who was the like main curator for this show she really made it happen uh but this idea was it was a collaboration um uh one time square and because of you know everything that's happening we weren't actually able to 
be there. So they created an entirely virtual world of, of, of New York and completely like brought us into it. And so I came in as a guest curator, Artix Code came in as a guest curator, and we put generative art kind of, sort of sprinkled around the city. And we also had an entire gallery. So if you were to like, keep walking forward in this space, you could go down and actually view this entire huge gallery space and walk past each other say hello people all over the world and it was amazing it was it was so so cool um and just to be able to to do that and to bring so many like amazing artists from all over um into into this virtual space and yes we couldn't have billions of people in times square but we were able to get I don't even know what the final number was, but all into this this virtual world to to celebrate. So, uh, you know, it was it was it was really exciting to be a part of that. And you know, big ups to Studio as we are and and One Times Square to, for really bringing it together. I love it. I love it. And I think you know this is a really kind of great point to start kind of wrapping up our panel tonight because you know you're there is this kind of um there's this aspect of kind of creating your reality if you will and using code as a tool to do so i think zoe you know very eloquently put it early in the in the conversation about using this as kind of a language um or as kind of a creative outlet to frame your reality and so i think you know just seeing how it was almost used as kind of a solution to a problem in the sense that we were all very siloed and yet there were opportunities to engage and to be you know kind of interacting during what otherwise wouldn't have been a very safe or, or conducive environment. So, you know, I think Sophia, I would love to kind of um, just have you maybe end your kind of portion of this talk. We're rounding out on 645. Mm -hmm. um, I want to open it up to everybody's questions at the end. So Sophia, what is one positive takeaway or one something, you know, very exciting for you about kind of the future of code and, and art? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, there, there's just so much and I think uh, specifically because of right now we this idea of kind of this digital citizenship and it, the, no borders around all of it we're seeing a lot of people in the space being propped up that I think in the traditional art space wouldn't have been uh, you know I, I really need to be put a huge shout out to Ayak Shells. And so she's a generative artist based in Panama and she did an artwork that just went for, you know, the equivalent of like, I think like $2 million. Um, and she's the highest selling NFT artist, uh, like female NFT artist, like at the moment. And, you know, I'm just like so happy and proud that like, because of where we're at at this moment, someone like her who probably like you know like is, is making such huge waves and when you think about just like this like traditional space that we've been living in in like the past few years um you know that that wasn't so common and and just now we have her kind of at the helm of this and and it's amazing and i'm super excited and uh, that's probably something that's happened that that just yeah i i, I just had to i have to say that yeah i love sure. it i love it i think that's a very a great concluding note um, Andrea, I am curious, you know, for us to kind of round out our conversation with you today, what are you most looking forward to about the direction of the digital art market and what is kind of to come for all of us? Oh, I th I'm excited about a lot of things right now. I, I think that uh, one thing that excites me the most is seeing artists actually being able to monetize work that before was so hard to sell or before was so hard to that for them to make a living out of creating this amazing work and lately i've been talking to so many artists that say like i've been making more money than ever by doing what i love and making all this artworks that before were not easy to sell or monetize um i'm also very excited to keep on like seeing what other experiences how we can keep on like pushing like boundaries on how to show art how to experience art and how technology is giving us the opportunities to do this every time more like i i mean 10 years ago, I would have never thought of a show uh, through your phone around the streets of different cities. Or so I guess I'm excited to see what else is to come. I love it. I love it. And Zoe, I think on on kind of our concluding note, I'd love to hear a little bit like what are you most grateful for in terms of what coding has opened in your life? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it was just an into, entirely new mindset and way of thinking, um, which was really frustrating when I first started programming, because I don't think I'm the most logical person and coding is all about specificity and logic. 
but I really appreciated, you know, like any artist, it's a tool, right? It's um, a tool that you can use as an artist to, again, be able to express yourself. And it pushed me to think about what I could create entirely new ways that I would have never considered if I was, you know, still confined to my sketchbooks or paintings. Um, and I, you know, honestly, for me, it was also a whole new mindset in terms of experimentation. You know, I think there are certain ways of experimenting, you know, with physical materials when you're making art. Um, but I personally am such a perfectionist <laughs> in so many ways. And um, I, you know, had to get really comfortable with ideas of iteration of, you know, building something, trying it out, constantly breaking it, obviously, you know, getting comfortable with errors. We talk about a lot, a lot of this when we're talking about teaching code, you know, like there are people who come in and they've never programmed and maybe they're not used to a scientific mindset and they're sort of like, why isn't it right? Like what's, what's wrong with me? And it's like, no, it's not about that. It's like, this is part of the process. It's part of learning. Um, so I certainly feel grateful in terms of how it's enabled, enabled me to, you know, think, think in entirely new ways. I think that's great. Well, ladies, this has been a pleasure. I think at this point, we are going to kind of direct it over to the Q&A section. Um, you know, for everybody who has participated today, both thank you for being a part of this. It's been really fun to have you guys. Um, and we're, we're excited. I think you can direct your questions to specific panelists. Um, I can also help kind of moderate and direct. So feel free to just um, unmute yourself and jump in, or you can put it in the chat and we can, and we can kind of take it from there. Are there any takers? <laughs> All right, well, I, I have a question that I can follow up with that came out of actually the conversation. And I'm seeing there's been some chatter in our chat about this idea of interrogating kind of the history of women in tech. Zoe, do you have any resources or is there any kind of reading that we should be doing about kind of learning more about that history? Yeah, that's um, a great question. There's, <laughs> I'm, I'll be honest, I'm the terrible person who can never remember things when put on the okay. spot, but um, there was a book that came out recently and I'm, I'm like literally like, can I search oh this God. and find it? Uh, Broadband by Claire L. Evans that came out a couple of years ago. I saw her speak at the New Museum and she was really looking at women at like the very beginning moments of the internet kind of like late 80s, early 90s in New York. Um, and I knew very little about that kind of era personally. I feel like I had some of the sense of like, you know, the beginning women at IBM. I feel like that's a really classic story. Of course, you know, like Ada Lovelace being the first programmer. Um, but broadband was super interesting because, you know, it's, it's so recent and yet still so unknown. And she gave, you know, a really great presentation. And there were people there at the talk who were featured in her book who are, you know, are still in these scenes. Um, so, so definitely recommend that book. Um, I think we have Kayla has just added a question to our chat. Um, the question is, do we think that the art world will become completely digitized in the future or physical spaces or physical pieces become rare? Um, I, I'll take that one. I think, uh, I, I don't think the art world as a whole will become, uh, Digitized. I think there will be a portion of the art world that will be completely digital. Um, I think we're seeing that now we have this idea of like virtual worlds and, you know, they have galleries in there that are all NFTs. Uh, you know, I've worked with artists who have created, you know, thousands of NFTs with their with their programs and only a small percentage of them have prints associated with them. And so you can kind of start playing around with this idea of rare uh, physical objects. So it's like a yes and no, like, yes, we will have parts of this world that are strictly digital um, and there will be a digital native art world. But I don't see, uh, you know, for the most part, people wanting to give up being able to hold something tangible. I think as humans, we we have uh, that need to be close to things that we like and admire. So uh, that's that's my take on it. I think I agree with Sophia that I don't think we'll ever see that go away and I wouldn't want it to go away. But I think that they can live in parallel and both be um, like you can enjoy both the same way and for not one to be more important than the other but just kind of like coexist 
um, I think that will happen, but I don't think that digital will ever fully replace physical. Yeah, I have to agree. I think there are also, this is a conversation for another day, but there are too many stakeholders that are not going to have the physical art world be too pushed out too, too significantly. I think they're going to have to find a way to kind of coexist. And I think also just the, the time that we're in the last year, you know, we weren't able to go out to, to art shows. We weren't able to like go out and experience things. So it was actually pretty nice to have this like digital um, alternative that you could go into a digital world and go look at digital art world, uh, artwork and, um, you know, see people's avatars and, you know, say hi. And then you can go off and, you know, have a, I don't know, have your dinner and you're, and you're all good. Um, but it, it, it's not, it, but, you know, that, and that's its own special moment, uh, you know, in its own. But at the same time, you know, being able to go out to a, a physical art show is probably one of the best, you know, experience ever to be able to, to host one, to go to Kadaf and be able to walk around and talk to all the artists. It's, it's the best. So um, I think they'll definitely just like continue to live, uh, you know, in, in parallel. Mm -hmm points where they intersect, which is also a completely different, interesting conversation. How do you kind of hold these events that honor both the physical and the digital spaces that we live in? Well, sometimes digital art is like the worst way to experience it is on a screen, but you just need to go somewhere and experience it in person. <laughs> it's better than seeing it in your computer. It's better when you're go physically to experience digital art in an immersive room where that you can interact or it's definitely a different experience. They definitely are a hybrid. Yeah. Um, I think we have one time for one more question, and this is a great one. Um, Brianna has suggested, have you ever had an encounter in your digital art experience that has been influenced by you being a woman? Um, have you ever had an experience that you would claim to be kind of gendered in that way? I have like a... a, a I've worked in the in you know as a in the tech industry for for some time, and I think that um, like as a developer on teams with men and all of these things, and I think you know there's a lot of um, dialogue outside of you know just all around that it's a bad place to be, it's a bad like you know that, that you find yourself in 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 dodgy situations, and I have to say that. I have not um, experienced that. I, I've had nothing but incredible coworkers and people who are, you know, willing to help and support me and help me if I'm if I'm not if I don't understand something correctly, I can talk to them and ask them. But I think um, by me, like in terms of just like womanhood and this idea of, um, you know, the like archetypal woman of like caring and nurturing, I think that has been uh, extremely helpful in my role as like a curator and someone who who forges relationships with artists uh, and helps them kind of again forge their path in this in this area. Um, I think that's something that you know we we do we can all help each other uh, like like a lot. I think and women also tend to like like stick together. Um, you know I, I've. I think during this talk, I've mentioned at least three women that I've worked with, you know what I mean? And we all and we all support each other in, in all the ways that that we can. Um, and yeah, I think just the experience of, of being a woman, woman and finding women all around this space and being able to prop each other up is, is super important. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I don't think it, it adds a um, I just want to make sure that that like you you can enter feel confident entering the space as a uh, you know in the digital art space as a as a human um, you know as as a person <laughs> yeah rather than gendered yeah that's great um, Rami do you think we have a few one uh, time for one more question or shall we wrap this up? one more is yeah perfect um, so. Maria has asked, do you think that the pandemic and less in-person events has affected the growth of the digital and the NFT market? 100%. 100%. Zoe, <laughs> how are you seeing it from the kind of like the subscribers and the uptick in coding? It's a really good question. We certainly saw a massive uptick in coding um, at the very beginning of the pandemic. We did our own online events. Um, so I actually did a P5 uh, workshop online twice, I believe, which was really fun. Yeah. Um, so it's it's been wonderful. You know, there are a lot of people who understand that, you know, 
working in tech has a lot of affordances, like the ability to easily work remotely. Like I'm on my work computer in Brooklyn right now. This is where I was during the work day too. Um, and so it's been really exciting to see people who have, you know, gotten interested in technology, want to change their lives and just, you know, have or had the time to figure out, you know, what is coding? Yeah, I love that. Well, I think that certainly is um, a vibrant and energetic market right now. And I think for any of the girls and the educators who are watching today, you should certainly feel very um, optimistic about a bright future ahead, both for your creative outlets as well as a profession, whether it's in the art sector or just the tech sector specifically. Um, but we hope that this has been kind of an enlightening conversation about, um, you know, we've, we've chosen and taken a lot of care to choose three really strong female leaders in the sector. Um, and so, you know, we hope you feel like you have some role models to look up to and, and always feel free to, to ask us some questions. Code Art is here for that. Um, I wanted to conclude with just saying we always kind of plug an event um, or a program with Code Art and these talks are used as an opportunity to promote them. Um, the Summer Code Her um, virtual intro series is going to be live and you guys, it's June 14th through August 13th. Um, so if you go on codeart.com, you can register. And I just think, you know, again, it's about seeking out the opportunities to educate yourself. And this is definitely an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Ellie, and I just wanted to add that we do have early bird registration up until tomorrow, and so I, and this this club is only for rising sixth to eighth graders. So the cool thing about this is that not only are they learning, but they'll be making friends within their age group, which we think is really really important. So you know they're having fun, making friends, and we're gonna you know touch on all the basics of coding. Um, so if you guys, if anybody in the audience or a panelist, anyone has a you know a younger sister, a niece. Uh, you know, a friend's daughter that you, you want to share this information with. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that early bird registration uh, expires tomorrow. So, so yeah, I'll put the link in the chat and we'll also send the follow-up email for that um, as well. So thank you. Amazing. And again, I think, you know, Zoe, you are a representative of Code Academy here today, but it is a big thank you to the full Code Academy team for coming on as a supporter. And Oliver Gal is our supporter season long, um, and it's really they've been very generous in just making this happen. So a, a big thank you to our partners, um, and moreover, thank you to our panelists and for the individuals who listened to our panel today. So thank you guys, and I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye.